right, good morning once again after a couple of weeks off. Today's November the 20th. Yes, it is. We're not going to have Thanksgiving week. Really. And we're about to uh, take a look at the little letter of 3rd John, 3 John, today. And we can't do that without also taking a look at 2nd John. When there's a connection between these two books that we need to, we need to keep and recognize the connection between these two books in order to understand uh, the importance of them. So it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be in the word of the Lord. Amen. That's our source of life, our strength, and God's people as well. It is good to be with God's people. And, well, I'm grateful for the ability of these, um, of having the camera and the, and the um, it's not a live stream, but it's but it's streamed online, online, so people can see that. But there's it's, there's no replacement for being together with God's people. It just isn't. If if you have to be at home and you can still get teaching of the Word, um, that's great. We never, you know, up until two years ago when, we, when COVID hit, we never uh, re video, videoed even our services, much less our classes. But since that started, it became something that uh, we want to continue to do because it gives access to uh, uh, to the Word for us. But still, if you have anybody who has the ability um, if you've got the ability to walk and you can get out and go to the store, you should be in God's house with God's people. We need each other. We build up each other. We strengthen each other. We are life to each other because of the Christ that lives inside of us and each other. So you can't, you can't get that watching it on TV, you know, week, days or weeks after it happened. You can get, the, you can get, you can get blessed. You can get fed. Fellowship of the Saints is also something that cannot be replaced. But anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for the day that you've given to us. This is the day that you have made. We rejoice in it and be glad. We're glad and grateful, Lord, that you, um, you've chosen us out of the world. You've given us your life in us, Lord, and it's your life that um, <coughs> nothing in this world can put out or quench out, Father, nothing. There's no amount of um, pain, persecution, affliction that can um, quench out the, the joy of the Lord and the life of the Lord because we serve a risen Christ. You're alive today and you're doing your work in your church and through your church, your people. We know that the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail against your church. And we pray, Father, today, that whatever we go through, it will draw, drive us to our knees and drive us to, to more to Jesus, in dependence on you, so that, the, so that we will know you greater than ever before. And the world will see greater than ever before that you're alive. We serve a risen Savior. We ask you bless this, bless us today. Bless your people today, wherever we meet. And in our conversation here, Lord, this morning, that we'll know your presence and your strengthening to us, first in spirit and in our soul, as well as in our body. We'll give you glory and we'll give you honor and praise today for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Third John. If you remember, a few weeks ago we looked at Second John, and I'm going to actually go back and uh, take take the moment to read that. It's only 13 verses. Third John is also 14 verses. Second John was written to the church, to a particular church, most likely Ephesus. We talked about that. Third John is written to an individual <coughs> brother in the Lord, the name Gaius, who 
uh, very well uh, could have been attached to the church in Ephesus. We'll see. And what Paul was, not Paul, John, what John, John was uh, exhorting in the, to the church in 2 John, he's now applying in a, in a very specific and particular situation in 3 John. 3 John has um, three, besides John himself, there's three individuals who are named here. So take a notice of these three individuals. And John is going to use each of these three individuals as a case in point. One of them, of what not to do, what not to be like. Don't be like this guy. And he's not afraid to say his name. You know, Demetrius. See what he's doing right there? It's wrong. It's not of God. It's not of the Spirit. Don't do that. And don't be like that. Here's why. And in fact, he's going to expose his motives. Because he's selfish. And he's thinking about elevating himself in the church. He wants to be first all the time. And then, uh, and then you have Gaius, who's, who is praised for his testimony. And then at the end, Demetrius, who's also... Um, praised not only for his testimony but for something else even beyond that and that and that is his reputation in the church amongst all the believers and amongst all the churches so his influence goes beyond just those that knew him so let's take a look at this letter the elder to my dear friend Gaius whom I love in the truth whom I love in the truth again John is uh, <laughs> referring to um, himself not by name, which is characteristic of him. Remember, he didn't, um, he didn't identify himself in, uh, in the gospel. He didn't identify himself in 1 John or in 2 John, just as the elder. And, uh, and in this letter, and also if you open up the first couple of uh, verses in uh, the book of Revelation, there is no salutation there either. Just the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although, uh, you get down into the middle of the chapter, and John does identify himself in uh, chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering, the kingdom of patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island, island of, of Patmos because of the word of God, the testimony of Jesus. So here he is in prison on Patmos, and he's describing the circumstances around which the Lord gave him this revelation, which you're about to read. And that's the only place where John identifies himself. John in the Gospel, remember how John identified himself in the Gospel? The one who Jesus loved. The one who Jesus loved. He identified himself the way Christ saw him. He saw himself the way Jesus saw him, the object of his greatest love. In terms of uh, his relationship with the church, he uh, sees himself, he wants to see himself the way the church views him or the way the church needs him as one of the 12. He's one of the 12 that I have a responsibility to, to teach, to mentor, to disciple, to father, as a spiritual father. The elder is, in a family sense, somebody who takes responsibility for those that are younger, right? As a father figure, whether it's an elder brother, because dad might be passed on, or whether it's a, uh, a father himself, or a grandfather, he's, the, he's an elder who bears responsibility and he bears a spiritual load for those around him and you care about others not only um, by what you do for them and give to them but it also in how you protect them from others I was reading something last a couple of weeks ago from and I something I actually posted from it was a quote from John Wesley who said um, and we don't have to think about this. It might have been from, this might have been from Martin Luther, who would, after he pounded the, 
95 Theses on the Wittenberg Door, which began um, the Reformation, said that uh, God has called us to, <clears throat> to shepherd the sheep and protect the sheep, and part of that means to protect them from, from um, bad doctrine, from error in bad doctrine. And that's what God was calling him to do, as he nailed in those 95 theses. I can't overlook the errors that are going on in the Roman church. They're too big. They're too pronounced. They're, they're major. They're not small things. They're major. They take us out of biblical Christianity. It has to be exposed. And if that means me getting excommunicated, then that's the way it will have to be. And you end up being, a, he ends up being a, a somebody without a church. A man who's, who's uh, thrown out because of himself being branded a heretic. That's always what what we what we have to do as elders, and what John did, what Paul did, what even Peter did. Peter wasn't the, known as a theologian, but but he still um, knew and understood that in order to resist the devil, you had to use the authority of Scripture. Remember that. Remember, it was Peter that said in first in Second Peter one twenty twenty one for. And the holy men of God spoke as they were moved and borne along by the Holy Spirit. That the, that the scripture, that we, the authority we have in the scripture is greater than what we have saw with our own eyes, heard with our own ears, when we saw him in glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. We have a greater authority in the written scriptures than that. That's, that was Peter. And Peter's not the theologian, he's a fisherman. He's not, he wasn't educated. The other guys that were educated and understood that doctrine matters. The purity and the truth of what the gospel is matters. And that if anybody comes teaching something in the church that disagrees or contradicts the gospel as it was delivered to us and as we delivered to the churches, let that man be eternally condemned or cursed. Galatians 1, 8, 9. need to know that. So here's what, in, in 2 John, remember he exhorted the church in 2 John, that if those that came into the church and they were discrediting John and the other apostles' teaching, and he's telling them, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't bring them into your house, don't invite them into your house, and don't eat with them. Don't go out to the restaurant with them <laughs> or have a meal with them because that indicates you're, you're embracing them and you're including them as one of us and one of you as an apostle, as a teacher, as a disciple. And that doesn't mean that you can't go to dinner with an atheist or a Muslim knowing full well that what you're going to discuss is your conviction that Jesus is the Lord, he's the Messiah, and what the scriptures teach. And, if, and on that basis, you, you can have, it's not fellowship, but you can have an acquaintance with somebody and eat with that person on the basis of, I'm a believer, and here's why. But what John is saying, what John was saying in 2 John, don't bring them home with you and don't eat with that person is a person who's teaching and, and, and he's teaching something about Jesus, about who Jesus is and what he did, what John calls the doctrine of Christ or the teaching of Christ. Who is Christ and what did he accomplish in his first coming? And if, some, if somebody is not in agreement about everything that we are saying about who Jesus was, that he is Nothing less than deity, God in the flesh, that he is Lord, he's Messiah, and everything that that means. The chief priests had it right 
when they condemned him at his trial, this, this, uh, this man makes himself equal with God, though being just a man. They were right. He claimed to be God. They understood that he claimed to be God. And uh, anybody who misses that and gets draws short of that, we should not be partnering with as disciples and as teachers, and they should not be named in our church. They want to come and sit and hear what we have to say. The doors are open. If they want to come and sit up on the pulpit and make themselves equal to the disciples, we cannot do that. We They have to be exposed as something that, that's other than Christian. Christianity and, and what we teach matters. So let's read, let's, let's read on. Dear friend, my friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. The truth is personified here. <clears throat> it's not only uh, a doctrinal statement that we agree with, it is a person. And, you know, John talks about that in 1 John. And he speaks of the truth as a living thing. He's the, he's the Lord himself. Gaius is a brother who we love because he loves the truth. We are both in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may also enjoy good health, and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I've got no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Not only that you know it, but that you're not afraid to talk about it with people wherever you go. There's Jews who reject it because they consider the teaching of Christ is antithetical to legalistic teaching that the Pharisees taught about the law of Moses. And then there's the pagans who didn't want anything to do with it because it, 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 would, comp, it would nullify all of their deities. There's no question about it that the lordship of Christ is exclusive and it excludes all other. So, um, so those who know who Christ is as... Uh, Lord of all for both Jew and Gentile are of the truth and I and uh, and those who uh, who we have taught and spoken into their lives as as the apostles as the disciples we are overjoyed when we see them living it and walking it and there is no greater joy that you can I and I can have in this life than to see that what but the life that you have in Christ is being passed <coughs> on to somebody else, to those that you're, you're speaking into their life. You want to do that, right? Hopefully, hopefully that when you go to work, you know that what you do, don't you like to come home at night and lay your head on the pillow at night knowing that the importance of what you did was more than just waiting tables at the restaurant or serving you know, that I meant something more to that because the life that is in me that is not me but is greater than me is flowing out of me and making a difference. And if that's not the case, what am I living for? You want to know that, right? Walking the truth. And you want that to be, I want that to be my children's passion and my grandchildren's understanding that I'm here for more than just to make a living or to do or perform some kind of function. That there's life. I was created to be alive. How do I get that? It comes through the person of the Son of God. Not just believing the right things about Him, which Judaism might supply. Might supply a lot of truths about who God is. Tell a lot of great stories about what He's done in history. But if it falls short of getting you to know him in a personal way, you're missing out. And we cannot compromise the truth because the truth is life. You compromise the truth and you compromise somebody knowing what it needs to have the life. And that's why John is all about belief. Dear friend, verse 5, 
You are faithful in what you're doing for the brothers. He's praising Gaius for the work that he's doing and serving the brothers. Even though they're strangers to you, you don't even know them. You may not even know their name, but because they're your brothers in Christ, you're dedicating yourself to serve, to uplift, to build, and edify the body to you. And they have told the church about your love, your love for Christ and your love for the people of God. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Now, this is a situation where the brothers that he's talking about are, are people that, uh, that John and some of the other disciples that worked with him were sending to the church. We'll just say Ephesus. We don't know for sure, but it's probable. We have a lot of cause to think it's Ephesus. Here, Ephesus being the most prominent church in Asia Minor, Minor and that uh, John had a, he spent several years there and had a, and he was a bishop there, you know that, later on in life. So he had, he had roots there. <clears throat> so John had sent certain other disciples there to build up, to teach, and to strengthen the church at Ephesus. What's going on here? Well, Gaius was one of the members of the church that welcomed them, understanding these guys are their, um, their colleagues of, of Brother John. And uh, these, guys are, these guys are discipled and they're from, they're from the 12. They're from the 12 apostles. And they're coming on that, on that basis. So he welcomed them on that basis and received them in the Lord. We want what you have to give us at this church. We received you. We want to hear what the word of the Lord is from you. And they gave their self to these brothers. And they gave their self to serve them and meet their needs when they came. Okay. And the church told us about that, that you welcomed them and you uh, welcomed them into, into the body there. And you sent them on, or on, on their way in a manner worthy of God, as if you had received, as if you had received the Lord Jesus Himself, right? You do, we should do no less than with His servants, as if it were the Lord Jesus Himself. In, in that kind of respect, it was the same. It was for the sake of the name Hashem that they went out. These <clears throat> the brothers receiving no help from the pagans. Ephesus was a pagan city, remember? The temple of Artemis of, uh, of Ephesus was there. And, of course, uh, the Jews would stand off at arm's length. They went out, and they, they went out for the sake of the name, and... Um, that they went out, received no help from the pagans. We thought we ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. Oh, but it's interesting that, uh, that uh, the name Jesus is taking this, this, uh, <coughs> this title, Hashem in the Hebrew for the name, Hashem. If you look in the footnote, and you're in IV study Bible, today, even today the Orthodox Jews address God by the title Hashem, which is the name. They don't pronounce it for whatever reason. They don't pronounce, they won't pronounce it Yahweh, Jehovah, Yahweh. Those are um, questionable pronunciations anyway because we don't have the vowel points in the in the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh. So that the Orthodox Jew won't attempt to pronounce it unless they, for, for whatever reason, might take it in vain. So they would call Hashem. Now, isn't it interesting now that the disciples now are routinely calling Jesus Hashem? Now that would, you, you, want, to, you want to grind that knife into the back of, a, of an Orthodox Jew or a Pharisee? Refer to the Lord Jesus Christ as Hashem, the, the name. <laughs> yes, he is equal to Yahweh. He is Hashem. 
And uh, there is uh, the, the note it, it, in this verse says, look at, look at Acts 4.12. Acts 4.12 is one of those verses that some of us memorized way back from the beginning of uh, Evangelism 101, Evangelism Explosion, if you remember that. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. The name of what? Jesus Christ. No other name given under heaven among men by which men can be saved or must be saved. He is, his is the name. His is the name that will be above all names and every knee will bow and every tongue confess. But his is the name that is only given by God, given from above, not from men. We didn't make it up. He sent it. Jesus Yeshua in the Hebrew. HaMashiach, the Messiah, which is just Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. It becomes Christ in the Greek text of the New Testament. So we don't have to be afraid to say Christ because we believe that the New Testament is inspired by the same Holy Spirit as the, who inspired the Old Testament. He is, he is the Christ, the Son of God, the living God. No other name given among heaven. He is the name. And his is the name that one must believe in in order to be saved, in order to be changed. The name of Jesus. It was for the sake of the name. Jesus, whose name is... Now, we, now it's not just Hashem, the name, as if there isn't a name. Just a name, the name, the one. Well, does he have a name? What is it? Would you call? Would you? Would you have a new? Would you have a new baby in your family and just call it the name? <laughs> you gotta have a name so we know how to refer to them. You know, you want to call this one and they, they don't all five of them come running. Yeah. But he has a name. He has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ, the Lord, and he's to be revered and loved as the Lord. And because of that name, we will suffer persecution from the Jew, the Orthodox, who said, oh, you're, pay you're, you're polytheists, even more than one God. Or from the pagans, who say, oh, you're exclusivists. You're saying that yours is right and all the rest of us is wrong. What are you, what are you, the, only, you're the only ones going to heaven, we're all going to hell. Huh? Well, let's see if yours measures up. Do your gods measure up to this one? What did he do? What is he, did, to, can you demonstrate that you didn't make the, your gods up? That he made you? You didn't make this up? We can. By everything that he's done in the past, it's written in the scripture. Sorry. And then... Where's the... Where are they? By what's going on. Okay. Bye. All right. All right, so we get to verse 9, and we get to the second guy here, Demetrius. So I wrote to the church, but um, Diotrephes, Diotrephes, rather, who, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. He's bad talking the rest of the disciples in order to lift himself up. Um, there's another there's another meme I saw us this week too it said uh, be careful who you let in your boat because there's people who will sink the ship just because they can't be captain <laughs> <laughs> and that is, that's true that's true in churches too as well as uh, as well as business <laughs> if, if I can't be captain I'm going to sink this boat just to show you that I should have been in charge well, that's, that was Diotrephes. So he, because he couldn't be captain, he badmouths those who are in the place or the position of leadership in that church. Why? And here, the, here John, was, John was chosen by Jesus, as was his brother James, and as was Peter and Andrew, and, and uh, Matthew, Levi, and the... And the the other 11, 
and uh, they are recognized after Christ's ascension into heaven as a foundation that is being laid and that the teaching that was going out from there, it, uh, it came from and it was endorsed by hands being laid on by the apostles. And if you remember, the head of the council in Jerusalem was James. I think it was James, the Lord's brother, not James, the brother of John, because he was already martyred with the sword. And the Jerusalem council met to, to, to determine what was going to be the policy. For example, in Acts 15, on, whether, on how far we were going to bring the Gentiles into Judaism or not, as far as adhering to the law of Moses. They had that counsel. And, uh, and to see that the churches were uniform in their teaching about Christ. Who was going to do that? Was every church going to have his own little authority and have his own little pope? <laughs> So that then, well, this church over here, I like this one over here, they say this. But this one over here, they don't believe that way, so I'm, I'm not going to go over there and listen to that. Well, there, but, but yet there was only one church. And you read it in Paul, there is one church, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So therefore, be of the same mind. Don't be, uh, don't be, uh, have a mind that is all over the place. We don't have the prerogative. At least on the, ter on the things that are essential, we don't have the prerogative to have a second opinion. There is a gospel by which all other gospels must be measured up to. And again, I appeal to Galatians 1, 8, and 9. If anyone comes with a different gospel, let that man be cursed. So here's Diotrephes rejecting the authority of other teachers, anybody outside of himself. There's an indication that there's a red flag right there that you've got somebody that's out of control. You might want to go somewhere else. You may not find anything that's wrong with what he says, but it just the fact of the seat that he's putting himself in is a big enough red flag where I might want to go somewhere else. He shouldn't be. <clears throat> and this, this, is what, this is what the apostles would say. Nobody should be in a position where he puts himself above and over the others in the body. Now you can have disagreements on secondary issues. Remember Paul and Peter had a disagreement on a secondary issue. What, did, what to do with John Mark? And later on they came together on it. But for a while they split. And that, that, those, are, those are practical issues. And they're, they're not in the same place on everything. But on the things concerning Christ and the Lordship of Christ and the doctrine, the way he calls the teaching or doctrine of Christ, there can be no second guessing on that. This one of the one of the objects of that, one of the ways we know, one of the ways we um, one of one of the criteria that we look at in an elder is that he's not argumentative. Right? That a person who is an elder in the church is not one given to argumentation. He's got a he's got a he's got a better answer, a better way to say everything. He's got he, I can criticize I can criticize everything that this guy, if I want to, I can critique everything that these guys have to say, and miss and miss the ship for 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 all the details. And that that shows that there's something fundamentally wrong with the person themselves. Okay, so not satisfied with that, look at this. There, he, goes to, he goes to a second level and he goes to a third level. First of all, he rejects the authority of the apostles and won't welcome them in the church. Second of all, not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who wanted to want to welcome the brothers. <laughs> Thirdly, he not only stops them from welcoming the brothers and treating them with respect, he throws them out of the church for welcoming other brothers. In other words, he's taking such an authority, this Diotrephes, that he's only allowing people who, to follow him. And anybody who will give 
uh, any weight of authority to other teachers who certainly came from God, they came from the apostles, and were sanctioned by the apostles in Jerusalem, he throws out of the church. Well, we have the marks of a cult here, mm -hmm. if not at yeah. least a sect of Christianity. He needed like a spiritual authority 101 class. And so he was really actually communicating people. So he actually should have been put out of the church by yeah, right. the others. Exactly what John is saying, I'm gonna do when I get there. Mm -hmm. When I get there. I'm gonna he's get, we're gonna we're gonna expose him and I'll call him out. Like who gave him this authority? He did. You know, yeah. And now that's the, where we're self most times when folks do that and it's you know, and they'll come with that. The Lord told me that. The Lord spoke to me. Yeah. You know. Uh, this is this is, and they can quote and you can quote scripture. And uh, this is, uh, and, and sound good about it, and sound right about it. But just remember this. Jesus quoted scripture when he faced the devil. Why did he, Jesus quote scripture when he faced the devil? He didn't give his own, he, he had the authority to tell, to tell the devil where to go, which he did to 9,000 demons when he cast them into those pigs. Remember that story? Mm -hmm. The legion? Mm -hmm. And with his authority, and the word of authority, he would have had the power to tell the devil to do the same thing. But he appealed to an authority that was higher than even himself. The word of God. It is written. <clears throat> now, let's just see, there's a lot of instruction in that. But one of the things is, is that remember that the devil's temptation <coughs> came to him with scripture. In each of the three times, the devil came quoting scripture. So the devil knows how to quote scripture too. And so do, people, so, so do um, many teachers. I once um, had a go call on a spiritist in a church that I was a youth pastor in, in Illinois. And the daughter was coming to our church, and she gave her life to the Lord. She was a new Christian. She was a teenager. We were part. We were leaders in a youth group at the time. And uh, her father was a spiritist, and he called on these guys called on uh, dead, the dead, for a blessing, dead angels and dead people. And uh, the odd thing about, about it about it was. And as we went over there, and I, I didn't go alone, I go, went with another pastor, and stood on his porch. We never got in past that, but by the time it didn't take long, about 10 minutes of conversation, we were threat we had our lives threatened. We continued to teach his stuff. But at the first, he was trying to he was trying to he was trying to convince us that he believed just like we believed. He showed us his Bible, and he showed us a hymn book that was used in most Protestant churches. And they actually sang all the same hymns that we would sing, that praise, gave praise to God and Christ was honored and the, the same hymns that, and here he was uh, saying and doing these things, but yet he's calling on the dead. And he wanted nothing, he, he absolutely refused that his daughter would come to that church. Well, he, she, if I remember right, I think there was, it was a joint custody situation and she would get over there um, with the other parent that she was staying with. Her but anyway, uh, he, he, he ends up threatening our lives. Well, that, 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 the idea was is that even the devil can quote scripture. Mm -hmm. And this guy was deceived into thinking that he was Christian just because they had a Bible, they used a Bible, they could quote the Bible, but the Jesus of the New Testament, he did not know. He contradicted. And he, he, he gave authority to some spirits that they called on and that visited them and there, it was more like a seance than anything else, but with Christian ease all around surrounding it. It's, that's what's called spiritism. And uh, it's, it's weird. It's a kind of a combination of uh, spiritualism, New Age, with a cloak of Christianity about it. Um, weird. So, um, this, is, this is what we, anybody who puts themselves outside of the, or above and beyond others, 
in the body of Christ to where they are not accountable to anything or anyone, red flag. God doesn't do that. God has calls people to ministry, but if you'll notice, when they're called to ministry, they're laid hands on by others over them <clears throat> who are older than them, who watch these people being mentored and grow in their faith and their knowledge of Christ, and will lay hands on it in endorsement, saying, this is a man who we see as, as, as people who have also walked this walk and, and, uh, and been down this road. This man is also worthy of this same ministry that we've had. See, nobody points himself. Jesus himself did not appoint himself as high priest. Remember that in the Hebrews? But it was given to him. And so will every other man. So this diatrophies, be careful <coughs> with uh, that. Did, anybody can quote scripture. But we are, in, we are enjoined. Now, I hear a lot of people that have said in the past years, too, that, look, this is just doctrine. Doctrine divides. Doctrine creates arguments. Stay away from doctrine. Oh, what a, wait, 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 wait. That's like saying the devil quoted scripture. He quoted it wrong. Let's stay away from scripture. <laughs> no. <laughs> scripture itself will answer the one who's misusing scripture. Because it is authority, the authority of God. And you have to stand on that. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And doctrine is important. It is necessary. It is what it is a ruler and our guide to keep us on the path of righteousness and truth. Right? That's a very important. So, um, <clears throat> do not it, do not it. Well, we'll just finish reading this passage here, about five minutes before. <clears throat> Dear friend, um, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does not, who does what is evil, is not seeing God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone. Here's a third brother that's mentioned, Demetrius who has a good testimony, and he's well spoken of by everyone. Now those we're talking about, particularly those in the church, who have served and who know and who have a, a, a track record of serving well in the body of Christ, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of Mr. Demetrius, and you know our testimony is true. So that is important. Having the witness of other brothers who are trustworthy is important. You know what, one of the, and I've said this before to our church, one of the most important things I got out of eight years of Bible college is the ability to know which authors and books are trustworthy and which are not. Because I know where they're coming from or what theological bent they're coming from and where they're strong at and where they're not as strong as strong at and who to go to in, in uh, certain subjects and that and which and uh, who to be aware of because I know they're weak in a certain area or they're off base on a certain doctrine there and that comes from being acquainted with uh, the authors and having to read and having to sh to um, brush shoulders with people of all these different theological stripes. So um, it, it matters to have a good, um, to be well spoken of by those in the body. It's important. Where where does guys come from? What what is our what is uh, you know what, what is our um, what does this guy say about that guy? That's, it's, it's not the only thing that matters because I, I'm still at the bottom line. I still have to read all things and evaluate all things and what, what is from God, what's, what's the light I get from God from this. But it's an indicator. And God, that's one of the ways that God has given us to keep us on the right path and to keep us protected from 
those who want to go their own way. I have much to write to you, but I don't want to do it now with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon so we can talk face to face. <clears throat> Peace to you. The friends here that are with me, send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Um, one more thing I want to bring out here. Let me see if I can find that verse. Actually, it goes back to 2 John. Just flip back a page to 2 John and verse 9 and verse 8. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist, okay? These, they're, they're deceiving, they're, they're, te they're not acknowledging Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. Watch out so that you do not lose what you've worked for, but that you so that you may be fully rewarded for the labors that you're doing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be careful. Paul said it this way, don't let anyone steal your crown. Mike, what's my crown? It's a reward for the, the things that I'm doing, not for self, not in my efforts, but that Christ is doing and working out through me. And that I don't allow myself to be compromised in any way by things that I think I need to do or what somebody else needs me to do to squeeze me into their mold. Don't let anybody lose that crown. You've got a call. You have uh, uh, heard the, the, the voice of the shepherd. You, and I'm talking about you individually and me individually. I will answer to the one who's given me that call for what he's calling me to do and to become. I have to run a race. I need to finish that course. I need to cross the finish line for what he's called me to do. If I stop halfway and I stop like 10 feet before the finish line because I'm distracted by what somebody else is doing or not doing or what they think of me or don't think of me, that's on me. Don't let anyone steal your crown. But here's what he said. Watch out that you don't lose what you've worked for, but that you may re and then look at verse 9. Anyone who runs ahead and doesn't continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. The, the phrase that I'd like to point out there is, he, he runs on ahead. We can go on ahead of God. You, this, what this reminds me of, and this is the way John ended the Gospel of John, and the way he ended the book of Revelation. Don't let anybody add to these words. Don't let anybody take away from these words. Because God will add to him a curse, or God will take away from him reward. Do not be, that this is what John is, he's, he is, uh, he is warning the church in Ephesus, and he was warning Gaius about this diatrophies. This guy is adding because he wants to, he wants to be said, look, I know John taught this, and I know Peter and, and Paul taught this. I've got a new revelation. Listen to what God's given to me. They don't have. You won't hear this from them. This is what God's given to me. And, Paul, and John is saying, be careful for that one that runs on ahead. And he, he, he thinks he's got to add to what God has already revealed to all of us in Jesus Christ. It's got to be stayed on him. Be careful. Be careful about running on ahead of the Lord and of the teaching of him. Hey, good, good stuff. You know what? I don't think we're done with this, this quite yet. But second, third John, um, second John. So maybe we'll finish. And you know what I'm going to do too after this, after third John. Um, <clears throat> how about we, how about we do Jude? Uh, we've got Jude right after that, and uh, we'll go and do Jude next. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, let's pray. Um, who wants to close in prayer? John, go ahead. Father, we do thank you for this time that you've given us this morning to look into your word. We thank you, Father, for the truth that you've given us, the truth in, in Jesus, our Savior. So, Lord, help us as we uh, walk this week. Lord, help us to walk in the truth and let the love of Yeshua just radiate through us, Father.
And as we celebrate Thanksgiving this week, Lord, just give us all grateful hearts for what Jesus has done for us, Lord. And we just thank him for who he is and what he's done. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.